First hymn will be 436. Redeem, 436. Wait, is the song I'm singing today. Scripture reading this morning is taken from Acts 2, 37 through the end of the chapter. Acts 2, 37 through 47. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. 
and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, every, as every man had need. And they continued steadfastly, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Please bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we come this morning thanking you for all of your blessings. We thank you for this beautiful day that we are enjoying. We thank you especially for your son Jesus who came and lived on this earth and died on the cruel cross of Calvary for our sins. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to worship you. Pray the things we do here this morning be accepted on thy sight. Pray that you will be with James. He will be able to present the things he has prepared so that everyone can understand and much good come from it. Pray that you will be those among our number that are not here because of sickness or whatever other reason. Pray that you will be with them and help them whatever their need may be. Pray that you will be with us in this country, that we will always have this opportunity to worship you without fear of outside information. Interference, pray that you will be with us through the rest of this service. Pray that you will forgive us of all of our many unforgiven sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Five thirty-six. Prepare our minds to take the Lord's Supper. We'll sing this hymn in five thirty-six. On a hill far away.
give thanks. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the love of Christ, for the sacrifice he made on Calvary, for this bread which represents his broken body. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may take of it in remembrance of that sacrifice. For these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Black men, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents to us Christ's shed blood on Calvary. We pray we'll take of it in a manner of be acceptable unto thee. For these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. For our giving, we'll sing 159, 159, the first stanza only, 159. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. give thanks for the blessing to give. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the many blessings that will bestow upon us this day. We thank you for the, the opportunity we have to give back to thee a portion that thou hast blessed us with. We pray that we will do it within a cheerful manner for these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Mark your hymn books at 143, the song of encouragement after the lesson. If you'd like to stand at this time, we're saying 626 before Brother James brings the lesson. 626, there's a light shining. There's light on the pathway, it's guiding me home, leading to that eternal day. And it beckons me on when the pathway seems dark, there's a light that is shining for me. There's a light guiding me. There's a 
Our study today is one that is by request, and I'm happy when I can to honor requests to study a subject that someone is studying that I might be able to add some help to your study. Our subject today is placing membership of the local congregation. We hear that terminology from time to time, and it, if you're new to an association with the church, you might wonder. What are people meaning by that? What's involved in that kind of thing? The church of the Lord is only as strong as the members that make it up. There are two sides or two senses or two spheres, if you please, of the church. One is the church universal, and second is the church locally. And every Christian should use everything at his disposal to make the local congregation of which he is a member as strong as he can make it. And when you begin to read, especially 1 Corinthians, there's an emphasis in whatever you do, build up the church, build up the local congregation is the emphasis in Corinth, and then universally the application of the principle. Some have developed a what they might call a member at large concept of church membership. They say, well, when I obey the gospel, I am added to the church. Yes, church universal. And thus there is never a reason to identify locally. So they've never placed their membership, they've never identified with a local congregation anywhere. And as a result of this misconception, those Christians miss the rich association 
that we may have as we serve God together in a certain locality. Let's notice, first of all, the church universally and locally. Every Christian, as I mentioned, is a member of the church universally. When he obeys the gospel, the Lord adds him to his church, Acts 2, 47 in the King James translation. The about 3,000 who were added together on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 41 and 47, were members of the church universally. But not all of them identified with the church in Jerusalem because they are from all different places, Acts 2, verses 9 through 11. At least 15 nations, if the one who named from which these folks came named all of them. So you have the church universally. Every time one obeys the gospel, he's added to the church universally. But then there's the church in the local sense. A local church is identified by the membership that makes it up. People are members of a local congregation. In Romans 16, 16, when Paul wrote, the churches of Christ salute you. The word churches there could very well have been the congregations of Christ salute you. There were various congregations. People were identified by the congregation of which they were a member. When those people who obeyed the gospel on Pentecost but were not from Jerusalem returned home, wherever they settled to worship, they would constitute a local congregation of the church. Christians are to assemble together for worship on the first day of the week. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and we're not to forsake our coming together to exhort one another. But we do so as members of a local congregation. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and look at what Paul says in verse 23. Now you remember chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians form a unit and they deal with the spiritual gifts in Corinth. In chapter 12, or chapter 14, rather, verse 23, Paul is talking about the use of those gifts in Corinth And he draws a conclusion from what he said about prophesying. Therefore, and he uses this this terminology, if the whole church comes together in one place. Now he's not speaking of the whole church universally. He's not speaking of everybody from every place in the world coming to one place. He's speaking of a local congregation. He's talking about Corinth specifically here. When you brethren come together, quit showing off your gifts and use what will edify those who are there and can profit by it. If you read Acts chapter 2 beginning and go through verse uh, chapter 7, you get an idea of how a local congregation, at least the one in Jerusalem, functions. Those who became members of the church from the teaching of those in Jerusalem were identified with the Jerusalem congregation. You might call it the Jerusalem Church of Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, Acts chapter 32 through chapter 5, 11 show how that local congregation worked in dealing with a benevolent matter and in dealing with how they brought goods to help one another. And in the midst of that, Ananias and Sapphira stand out as selfish people. When problems arose in the Jerusalem congregation, they were handled by members of that congregation. In Acts 6, verses 1 to 7, when the Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily ministration, the apostles said, you look out certain ones from among you that we may appoint over this matter. That would have been members of the local congregation. They would have known who was a member of the local congregation because they were all identified with that congregation. So they would not have gone some other congregation of the church universal to try to find someone to appoint over this work. It was a local congregational matter. In Acts 8, verses 1 to 3, we learn that the local congregation in Jerusalem 
was being persecuted by Saul. It's called the disciples. They are the disciples of the Lord in Jerusalem. That's the Jerusalem congregation. And Saul was laying them waste. He was dragging them into prison and having them executed. Acts 8, 4 shows that upon the death of Stephen, the members of the Jerusalem congregation were scattered abroad, and they, everywhere they went, they went preaching the word. And wherever they would locate, they would constitute a local congregation in that place. Acts 11, verses 19 to 30 show that some of them established a congregation in the city of Antioch. Acts 11.22 shows that where or that there was a local congregation at Jerusalem and there was a local congregation at Antioch and the local congregation in Jerusalem sent one of their members, Barnabas, to the local congregation in Antioch to assist in the work there. Barnabas went to Tarsus from Antioch and brought Saul to Antioch, and notice the terminology here. For a year, Acts 11, 25 and 26, they assemble with the church at Antioch, the local congregation at Antioch. So they would have placed their membership, as we use that terminology, with the church at Antioch, and they would have been identified for that period of time which they lived there as members of, of the local congregation in Antioch. In Acts 8, 5, verses, or verse 5 through 25, we see the establishment of a local congregation in Samaria. And those who obeyed the gospel would become members of that local congregation. When they obeyed the gospel, they were members of the church universal, and then they would form that congregation in Samaria, and they would be members of there. Well, those who were members of the Jerusalem congregation heard of the establishment of the church in Antioch, or in Samaria rather, and they sent Peter and John to them to give them the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, Acts 8, 14 through 17. In Acts 9, 1 to 25, we see that there was a local congregation at Damascus, and you will be turning there to Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> and we want to look at some things in this chapter. It was constitutive of those who were members of that congregation in Damascus. And for a while after his conversion, Saul identified with the church in Damascus, and he was involved in the work there and he is confounding the Jews who dwell in Damascus proving that Jesus is the Christ he's a member of that Damascus congregation but Saul left Damascus and he came to Jerusalem I want you to notice beginning in Acts chapter 9 and verse 26 when Saul had come to Jerusalem he tried to, now the New King James says, join the disciples. He tried to join the disciples. That means to join yourself to as an associate, to keep company with. We would say place membership with or be identified with the church in Jerusalem. So when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to place his membership, the way we say things, at the or with the congregation in Jerusalem. So this implies a formal attempt to identify with a local congregation. Saul came to Jerusalem and he told the brethren, I want to be associated with you. I want to be identified as a member of this congregation. But notice this, circle it. But they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. All right? They didn't believe he was a Christian. They'd heard how he was killing Christians. It didn't make sense to them 
that he would come to Jerusalem, try to place membership with a group of folks he was trying to kill, unless he was trying to get in among them, identify all of them, so he could kill all of them, drag all of them into prison, and give his voice against them. So they're afraid of him because they do not believe that he's a disciple. All right? Notice, circle it, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas vouched for him, we might say. Barnabas said he is a Christian. Here's where he obeyed the gospel. Here's what he's been doing since he obeyed the gospel. So he was, now notice this, the New King James says, he was with them at Jerusalem. There's a local congregation. He was with them. What did he come to Jerusalem to do? Join the disciples, verse 26. So here's a member of the church universal who has come to the church local and said, I want to be identified with you. I want to place my membership, as we speak of it, here, and I want to work with you, the church in Jerusalem. And they said, we don't believe you're a disciple. We don't want you here. We're not going to allow you to place membership. Barnabas said, yes, he is. Here's the evidence. He's faithful. He needs to be accepted as a member of the local congregation in Jerusalem. And when he did that, they said, good. We welcome you. We're glad that you are a member here. And he was working with those brethren until his life was threatened and they sent him out of town to save his life. So as we look at an attempt to place membership with a local congregation, we learn some interesting things from this. We learn that just because someone wants to place membership with a local congregation, doesn't mean he ought to be allowed to. Acts chapter 9 shows there ought to be an investigation to determine why one is coming to place membership with a congregation and if, in fact, he is even in fellowship with brethren, even if he is a brother or a sister in Christ. Of course, that responsibility where elders are existent will fall upon the local eldership to determine, number one, is this person a Christian? Have they obeyed the gospel plan of salvation as it's revealed in the text? Number two, is he a faithful Christian? Is he living faithfully? Is he in fellowship with other brethren who are in fellowship with God? You see, in 2 John 9 through 11, we learn that a local congregation cannot extend fellowship to false teachers. John wrote to the elect lady, probably Syria, and said to her, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching that we've been teaching, that's inspired teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting, for he who gives him a greeting becomes a partaker of his evil work. So I welcome someone in to my house and I support them while they're teaching false doctrine. I'm guilty of supporting false doctrine. That, would say, that same thing would be true of a local congregation. We welcome someone who's a false teacher. We support them and encourage them while they're teaching false doctrine. Then the whole congregation becomes guilty of supporting false teaching. The church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 found some among them to be false apostles. Notice this. John says by testing them. Well, we have the New Testament. So we can find out what people believe. We can find out what they're saying, what they're teaching, what they're telling folks. And we can take the New Testament and we can see, is this right or not? Here are some folks who were claiming to be apostles in the church at Ephesus, the local congregation. And the church there tried them and found out they were false. And they rejected them. If they were members there, we'd say they withdrew fellowship from them. 
In Revelation 2, verses 12 to 29, the, church at Pergam the churches at Pergamum and Thyatira, Thyatira had people in them that needed to be disciplined. They were encouraged by the Lord to repent and to discipline these members. And when they were disciplining them, this would certainly be a part of their repentance. So Jesus said, as long as you allow these folks to be members there, then you are out of fellowship with me. And I'm writing to you, and I'm telling you to repent. Well, how would they repent? Part of that repentance would be in withdrawing fellowship or disciplining those false teachers. Elders have a responsibility to know who is placing membership and why. It has boggled my mind that people can get disgruntled in one congregation and run to another and want to place membership, and the elders of that congregation never ask why and never contact the congregation where they're leaving to find out did they leave in good standing? Are there problems that need to be corrected? And if they are, they would tell those people, we would welcome you warmly in this congregation, but only after you straighten out those problems that you've left. And so there is not always, when someone comes in and says, we want to identify with you, there's not always a welcoming. There's first of all an investigation. From where are you coming? Why are you coming? What is your intent in being here? Are you in good standing with the congregation you're leaving? Are you in fellowship with them? If not, if you're in the wrong, you need to make a correction. If they're in the wrong, then they need to make some corrections. But there's just not always the welcoming. They're, they were afraid of Saul. They said, no. No, we will not allow you to place membership here until Barnabas said he's in fellowship with the saints. He's been preaching with the church in Damascus, and here's all the good work he did. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, we learn there were local congregations in Judea, in Galilee, and in Samaria. Well, who would be those local congregations? They would be composed of those whose membership was placed in those congregations. In Acts 9, 36 to 43, we learn that Dorcas was identified with a local congregation at Joppa. And she was busy working in that location and was recognized by those brethren who were there. In Acts 20 and verse 31, we learn that Paul worked with the congregation at Ephesus for three years. Surely he would have identified with the congregation at Ephesus and worked under the oversight of those elders. Acts 20, verse 17. He made sure that they remembered the work that he did while he was among them. Letters of commendation were often sent from one congregation to another or from Paul as an apostle to a congregation regarding some folks who were coming there. These letters exhorted the brethren to welcome those into their number and work with them. This would imply the placing of one's membership with a local congregation. When Apollos left Ephesus, the congregation in Ephesus sent a letter to Corinth encouraging the brethren there to welcome, and that word welcome means to grant one access in the capacity in which he wishes to be regarded. Well, how did Apollos want to be regarded there as a member in this congregation in Corinth? So Apollos would want to place membership there and work there. Paul wrote, the congregation in Rome, commending to them Phoebe, who at that time, at the time Paul wrote, was a member of the congregation in Sincrea. She was coming to Rome. She would place her membership there, Romans 16, 1 and 2. And he wanted the congregation at Rome to receive, and that word means to admit, to receive into intercourse and companionship. So Phoebe's coming, you welcome her as a member there, she's in good standing, she's faithful. Commandments, that word means a charge or an injunction, had been received by the congregation in Colossae to receive, grant access to, not to refuse friendship or intercourse with Aristarchus. 
if he came to them. Colossians 4 and verse 10. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, and we've studied this verse in great detail when we were studying elders and deacons, saints, bishops, and deacons were associated with the local congregation at Philippi. The only organization God ever gave for the church was at the local level. Elders can only oversee the congregation where they're elders. Deacons can only be special servants in the congregation of which they're members. Members are identified with the congregation where they place their membership. If that were not true, how could Paul know who the saints in Philippi were if they were not identified with that particular congregation? When the jailer in his household obeyed the gospel in Acts 16, 27 to 34, they became members of the church universal. Unless they identified themselves with the congregation at Philippi, how could they be under the oversight of those elders that Paul wrote about there? Those elders wouldn't know who the members they were to oversee were unless those members let it be known they were identifying themselves under the eldership there or with that local congregation. Elders are to be appointed in local congregations. This is what Paul did on his missionary journeys, Acts 14, 23. These elders were to rule over those who identified themselves with that congregation. You see that admonition, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13. Know those who are among you and who are over you and esteem them highly for their work's sake. How can he take care of the house of God? 1 Timothy 3, 5, a qualification of an elder. Well, what house does an elder, of what house does an elder take care? It's not the church universal. Elders here have no authority at all in another congregation. It'd have to be the church in a local sense. Hebrews 13, 17, we are to obey those elders who rule over us and imitate their faith. Well, we need to know who our elders are. We need to know what their lifestyles are so we can imitate them. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, Peter is an elder writing to elders about eldering. And he says to them there, take the oversight or oversee the congregation, oversee the church. And he gives them practical admonition in taking care of a local congregation. Notice, he says the elders who are among you, among you, who is the you there? It have to be a local congregation because elders can oversee a local congregation. I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker, a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Notice that. There's the church in a local sense. Well, how in the world would these elders know whom to shepherd if those folks hadn't identified themselves with the congregation there, if they were just members at large? If they just said, I'm a member of the church, universal, but I'm not identified with this congregation, then the elders would know whom to shepherd. Serving as overseers, whom would they oversee? They wouldn't know whom to oversee. Not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you. Who's entrusted to a local eldership? It's that local congregation. And the elders here could not know that they were responsible for me if I hadn't identified myself in some way as being a member under their oversight. You be examples to the flock. Who's the flock there? That's the local congregation. So Peter writes to those to do that. Acts 20 and 28, Peter or Paul wrote to those elders at Ephesus and fed, said, feed the flock, shepherd the flock. Well, they can't feed the flock if they don't know who the flock is. They can only know that if people have indicated we're placing ourselves under your oversight. We are becoming sheep in your fold, and you are now responsible for us. That's what we call 
replacing membership. Elders are responsible for the souls of the flock they oversee, Hebrews 13, 17. They cannot oversee and rule over souls if they do not know who the souls are for whom they are responsible. And they can only know that if I tell them. If every Christian were a member at large, a member of the universal congregation, but not a member of a local congregation, we wouldn't need elders. There wouldn't be any souls for them to oversee because God never appointed a universal eldership. He only appointed leadership in a local congregation. Well, when we think about placing membership of the local congregation, let's think about some reasons for doing so. I'll give you three. First of all, to show strength and encouragement from the congregation and to give strength and encouragement to the congregation. This is what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth about the spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. You use these spiritual gifts to build up the congregation there, not, not to divide it over who has what gift, not to show off your particular expertise, but you use what you have to bring the congregation together. Well, if I, if I think you're a visitor, I don't know your local member, I won't get any encouragement from you because we won't be together. We won't be knowing we're working together in any project. You're just a visitor. And so you don't add that strength to a congregation. Second, to strengthen and restore the weak and the unfaithful. How would someone who's not a member of the Smyrna congregation go to an unfaithful member of the Smyrna congregation and say, we want you to be restored and come back and work and worship with us? Well, they'd look at that person and say, you're not a member. You're a member of the church at large, but you're not a member of the church at Smyrna. So to whom are you going to restore me? If I come back, where do I come? You want me to come back to Smyrna? Why? You aren't a member there. So you go in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, and you bring back the weak members to follow the pattern met, set by a New Testament organization, elders, deacons, and saints. There are at least four reasons that some, in my 52 years of preaching, I have discovered object to or will not place membership of the local congregation. First of all, some have not been taught that they ought to do so. They've never thought about it. No one's ever taught them, but they are so honest that when they learned this was the pattern given in the New Testament, they readily place their membership of the local congregation and go to work. We can't do what we don't know. So when we're taught, we want to do what we know to do. Second, some do not want to be under the oversight of an eldership. They want to do as they please and not have to answer to anyone. And they won't admit it, but that includes the Lord. Now, they know if they place membership with a local congregation, they're subject to the discipline of that local eldership if they are not faithful. And folks thinking like that will take one to hell. What that person is saying is, I don't want to be faithful to the Lord, and I don't want anybody to call me into account for it. I don't want to have to answer. I just want to live like I want to live. In the third place, some won't place membership because they don't want to be expected to work. Floaters are always visitors, and visitors are never called upon to shoulder a load. We never ask our visitors to do the work of the local congregation. They're just visitors. And the indication seems to be they don't want to do the work. I just want to visit. I just want to come sit on the pew, and you leave me alone, and you don't call on me, and I won't be a member of the local congregation. In the fourth place, some think they have place membership when they have not. Just attending somewhere does not constitute placing membership. People have to tell you what their intentions are. When Saul came to Jerusalem, he didn't just start visiting the congregation, just show up there and stay for a while and expect everybody to assume that he was a member there. When he came, they were afraid of him. But he came specifically asking to join them, to place his association with them. 
He wanted them to know, I want to be identified here. I want to be a part of you. And that's when Barnabas was able to present him, vouch for him, and the brethren said, this is great. We're glad to have Paul as a member of this congregation. Well, if you decide that's what you want to do and what you ought to do, how do you do it? Well, the Bible doesn't give us a set procedure. But in Acts 9, 26 to 28, Saul told somebody he made his desire to place membership of the local congregation in Jerusalem known to someone who made it known, notice this, to the entire congregation because the entire con congregation was afraid of him. And they all knew he was trying to be associated with them. And they all said, we don't want him. And they said that so that Barnabas knew, I need to vouch for this man. And thus he did so. There are a number of ways you can do it. You can make your desire known. You may fill out a, a card. I think on, one of, on our visitor's card, there's a place to check. I desire to place membership with the Smyrna congregation and that alerts the elders to come speak with you and to decide what your situation is and what your intentions are you may tell someone else who's a member of the congregation who can inform the eldership but this just needs to be done in some way that lets a congregation know I will be here and I want to be counted on I want to be identified. I want to be under this eldership. I want to participate in the work of this local congregation. All Christians need to be identified with a local congregation and work, not just be identified with. Go to work in that local congregation and build it up. Use your talent, use your ability to build it up and help it reach the lost because that's the reason we exist, to seek and to save lost souls. It may be that you're not a Christian. We'd be happy to study with you, and help you to learn what the Bible teaches one to do to become a Christian. Summarily spoken, one must believe in Jesus as God's Son, John 8, 24. The evidence for that belief is found in God's Word, Romans 10, 17. One must repent of sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And be baptized into Christ unto the sending away of sins, Acts 2, 38. One must then be raised to walk a new lifestyle, Romans 6, 4, and to walk it faithfully, Revelation 2, verse 10. When we sin as Christians, and we will, we need that to repent of it. And right then, right there, ask God to forgive us, Acts 8, 22 to 24, with the full assurance that he will, 1 John 1 and verse 9. What a privilege to work in a local congregation of the Lord's people, to build up, to teach, to encourage, and to help. And if we might help you while we stand and encourage. Come to him now.
Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for this Lord's Day that we was able to come here and hear your word. Uh, we're thankful for the, uh, the worship hour that we have and the Bible studies and all the uh, things that we do here that uh, pleases you and may they all do that uh, we do things uh, according to your word and uh, we're just thankful especially for your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice for mankind. Uh, we are thankful for the universal church uh, around the world uh, that is your one true church. And uh, we pray for those that are in harm's way that are having to come together and uh, do the things that they need to do inside of you. And uh, we just ask you to keep them safe and have their faith stay strong. We do thank you for uh, the local churches and the called out people here at Smyrna and uh, we're just asking you to be with us as we uh, try to do your will and uh, may we uh, study your word to try to do better as we walk this life and uh, get closer to you and know your son better and the love that you showed for us and we want to show our love to you by obeying your word and looking into it more. Uh, we just ask you to uh, let us be strong and uh, stay faithful, and uh, we know that we'll have trials and tribulations, and uh, this is just part of life, and uh, we just ask you to uh, help us through those things. We do thank you for the avenue of prayer that we're, we're able to come and talk to you and leave it in your hands, and uh, we're just thankful for these things. We do ask you to be with us as we part here, that you keep us safe, and uh, may we want to be back here tonight and we ask that your will always be done in Christ's name we pray amen it's that wonderful month again that I get to do announcements and I have them open your bulletin